on to our next presenter. He is Dr. Islam Ramadan. He's an anesthesia fellow in the liver, liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgeries. Uh, Dr. Islam has uh, an MD, a DESA, EDAIC, FCAI. He was an air, uh, airway fellow at uh, anesthesia department at Beaumont Hospital, Dublin, Ireland. He's a college tutor for final year medical students and airway instructor in Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, RCSI. He's a lecturer also in Ain Shams University uh, uh, Hospitals in Cairo, Egypt. He has a special interest in airway and pediatric anesthesia. Dr. Islam will be giving us a lecture today about about airway, um, uh, obstructive airway management. And uh, the mic is all yours, Dr. Islam. Thank you very much for your great time. Please, thank you so uh, much, Dr. Ines. Thank okay. you so much for your, uh, your lecture. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Dr. Islam. Thank you for your uh, lovely words and your introduction. And uh, I want to thank all the committee uh, uh, behind the, the mega course uh, who give their time and effort uh, for this course, and I'm honored to be a speaker in this course, really. Thanks for all of you. So um, I will share my slides here. So our uh, lecture today is uh, a hot topic, uh, talking about management of upper airway obstruction. Uh, so hot topic in, during the exams and uh, also in our uh, clinical practice. Um, so the objectives of these lectures uh, will talk about uh, decisions when and how uh, you will do intubation uh, for upper airway obstruction and what other alternatives for that. Um, airway assessment, quick review for that and some definitions about it. Uh, systematic approach of management of airway obstruction. And these three points will go through a case scenario to make it more interactive. Um, and at, at the end, we'll talk about uh, briefly about the guidelines for awake tracheal intubation, uh, 2019, and uh, can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario, and the front uh, of neck airway access. So, if we talk about this case, uh, imagine you are, have been asked by uh, the ANE registrar to review a patient in the recess, 66 years old woman uh, who is presented by difficult of breathing and strider. With history background of obesity, high BMI, COPD, and uh, pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So, what is your reaction and what is your, will come to your mind while you are going to check this patient? Of course, all the anesthetists, when they hear Strider, you have your heart rate will come up and you will be more uh, alert and uh, worried about the patient. But, anyhow, as we said, this is uh, one of the most frightening situations that, that the anesthetists may encounter, really. And uh, I want to emphasize that there is no universal uh, guidelines or best approach for management of uh, upper airway obstruction. Um, your management will depend on answering two questions. Is when I will secure the airway? Is it an emergency that I have to do it in the ANE or in the ward? or I, I have time that I can optimize the patient, I can shift the patient to the theater. So it will, it will guide your management for this one. The second one question is how I will secure the airway. So is it a conventional uh, induction and intubation or I will do a weak tracheal intubation where the patient will be tracheostomy. Usually you always you put plan A, plan B and plan C for your patient. So intubation is based on three fundamental clinical points. All of us will uh, know about this one. Uh, the first question is, is there a failure of the airway maintenance and protection of the airway, like low GCS, less than eight, in traumatic brain injury or in intoxication? Is there a failure of ventilation and oxygenation, like status asthmaticus or COPD exacerbation? Uh, and what is the uh, anticipated clinical course? And this is very important and uh, really depend on the experience of the anesthetist. For example, like step, neck wound, polytrauma patient, angioedema, and burn. Those kind of patients can be presented in the ANE asymptomatic from the air uh, point of view, airway point of view, or mild symptoms, but suddenly they can be uh, rapidly progressive and you have complete airway obstruction. So you have to be ahead of them and anticipate the progress of this disease. Um, any action are required before performing actual intubation. So uh, you have to, think, according to your assessment for the patient's need of intubation, as we discussed in the previous slide, and the urgency of the situation. 
determine the best the best method of airway management based on your assessment and we will discuss this one in the coming slides decide what pharmacological agents are indicated what order uh, what doses you will use and prepare a plan in the event that the primary method is unsuccessful and this is a very important point and this is my advice for all the attendees that usually I have plan a and plan b if the plan a is not working so how to approach the patient on your assessment so the first uh, the, the first thing uh, be sure that there's an airway patency and this can be confirmed easily by asking uh, the patient what's your name do you know where are you if he's answering he has a patent uh, airway assessor airway we will discuss this one in the coming slide but roughly uh, quickly if there's uh, like limited mouth opening like uh, short mental distance like this little uh, microgantia and short mental distance limited mouth opening uh, third point is to assess the ventilation and this is can be done simply by taking an abg to see the po2 and co2 assessment of patient anticipated clinical course as we mentioned before like angioedema this patient of course rapidly progressive to be a difficult scenario if you are going to intubate this patient so in terms of airway assessment uh, there's some useful uh, minimalist uh, talk uh, for difficult or assess difficult laryngoscopy difficult uh, by manual vent uh, mask ventilation difficult lma insertion difficult cricket anatomy so if we go for the difficult laryngoscopy we are usually uh, we can use lemon score this is uh, l for look externally and usually if there's an official trauma uh, beard or mustache uh, big tongue or uh, prominent uh, inc incisors and e for evaluation three three two one so three fingers here uh, for the mouth opening uh, three fingers between the mentum and the hyoid bone two fingers between the hyoid bone and the thyroid and this three three two rule is to be sure the alignment of the pharynx larynx and the trachea all of us of course we know the malabetic score obesity and obstruction neck mobility roman for difficult uh, by manual mask ventilation uh, radiation rest or restriction of uh, of neck movement, obesity and obstruction. This lady, we have to be sure that the uh, mask to be uh, fitting and seal on the face. Old age, no teeth. Also, all these uh, parameters for uh, anticipated or uh, by manual mask ventilation difficulty. Rods for uh, difficult LMA insertion. Again, radiation, obesity, distorted airway, short theramental distance. And smarts for uh, smart for cricothyroidotomy, uh, any surgery in the neck, mass, a distorted anatomy, radiation, or tumor. And this is an example. Of course, in this case, it's nearly impossible to do any uh, uh, cricothyroidotomy or tracheostomy. It's a very difficult case. We have four key signs for upper array obstruction. I don't want you to forget it, which is muffled or repetitive voice, inability to swallow secretion strider and dyspnea these four uh, key signs for upper airway obstruction the first two it doesn't indicate that there is a complete or nearly complete upper airway obstruction while if the patient is a stridor, be sure that there's more than 50 percent of the airway is obstructed already and it's a serious condition we'll go for some definitions uh, uh, so if you ask me what what does it mean difficult by, uh, back mask ventilation or difficult laryngoscopy so we'll go uh, uh, one by one for this one. And there is no universal or, 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 or I total agree about these definitions. They are different in many literatures, but I pick uh, the most common uh, definition that we are using. So difficult back mask ventilation is an ability of unassisted anesthetist to maintain oxygen saturation above 90 on FI200% or FI21, uh, or difficulty maintaining mask seal and obtaining satisfactory anti-tidal CO2 and tidal volume. The incidence of difficult mask ventilation is one to two uh, per hundred, and the incidence of impossible mask ventilation is one to two per 1,000. Difficult laryngeal mask ventilation, inability within three insertions place the laryngeal mask in a satisfactory position to allow clinical adequate ventilation and airway patency. And when you are talking about clinical adequate ventilation, we mean that tidal volume of seven ml per kg and peak pressure uh, not more than 50 to 20 centimeter water. And the failure rate of LMA is around 2%. Uh, 
difficult laryngoscopy, it is not possible to visualize any portion of the vocal cord after multiple attempts by direct laryngoscopy, the conventional one. Uh, difficult intubation is difficult or failure of to uh, do tracheal intubation uh, or tracheal intubation require multiple attempts in the presence or absence of tracheal pathology. Uh, we'll continue the case. So you went and you did your physical examination, which revealed uh, the patient that patient is somnolent but arousable, uh, working hard, respiratory distress, uh, supraclavicular and suprasternal retraction, and uh, you can appreciate really high inspiratory uh, strider. And when you are doing your airway assessment, uh, you have a limited mouth opening beside the high BMI. So we have we have many points here that indicate or predict difficult airway management, high BMI, limited mouth opening. You have a mass which uh, led to a respiratory strider. And from this uh, working hard uh, criteria and uh, somewhat expecting that the patient start to have uh, some sort of uh, respiratory failure as well. So we'll highlight some points on strider, which is a harsh monotone airway sound produced during airway flow through an obstructed airway. Strider may be high or low pitched, may be audible uh, by bedside or um, uh, need to, to be auscultated, and maybe inspiratory or expiratory or biphasic. Again, as we said, strider, meaning to say that more than 50% of the airway is obstructed, uh, especially in pediatric population, and anxiety, coughing, crying may lead to total collapse of the airway. Uh, from the pattern of the strider, you can detect a, or determine the level of the airway obstruction. So, uh, if the patient has an inspiratory strider, most probably the obstruction is in the upper airway, as you can see here. While biphasic strider, it is uh, mid tracheal, uh, while expiratory strider is lower airway obstruction. So, it'll give you roughly uh, where is the obstruction. So the causes of airway obstruction, uh, we can classify it according to anatomical location, glottic and supraglottic, uh, su uh, subglottic, and uh, mediastinal or intrathoracic. And tu uh, tumors, like tumor epiglottitis, uh, deep neck uh, uh, infection, anaphylaxis, angioedema, foreign body, and there's a lot of reason for this one. So you decided for our case to do an ABG, which revealed the respiratory acidosis, with good oxygenation type, one respiratory failure. Endoscopic examination uh, revealed large friable mass filling nearly the entire pharynx and supraglottic area, unable to visualize the vocal cord. The patient is in semi position, working hard, and high flow oxygen cannula. Out of concerns of the upper airway obstruction and respiratory failure, you decided to secure her airway by doing intubation or, or securing the airway. Uh, I want to, uh, to also to uh, emphasize about the endoscopic examination or what we call nasal uh, nasal endoscopy. Usually, uh, in the elective list, is done by the ENT or head neck surgeons in their clinic if patient have any supraglottic uh, or glottic uh, tumor. But uh, I recommend if anyone has a uh, patient uh, that presented by in, uh, as an emergency of upper obstruction or even in the elective list and suspect difficult uh, intubation, it's very simple, just uh, local uh, like Duquesne spray, nasal like Duquesne spray, go by the fiber optic, okay, uh, very gently, just to see the vocal cord and localize where is the mass, to see the size of the mass, that if there is any deviation of the trachea, it will give you indication about the success of the awake fiber optic if you are planning to do awake fiber optic intubation or other other alternative like uh, awake tracheostomy. And this is the case, as you can see, this is a tumor, subaglottic tumor, and you cannot appreciate the vocal cord. So it would be uh, very difficult, even if by awake fiber optic, this case. So to secure the airway, we have five principles and you should keep them in your mind while uh, you are thinking how to manage the airway for upper airway obstruction. The first principle, uh, I want you to know that the clinical picture dictates your action. So don't wait until the patient is uh, hypoxic or desaturation to uh, let you decide to secure the airway or to go for intubation. Usually hypoxia is a late sign. So your, your, your decision should be taken uh, upon the clinical picture of the patient. Your clinical assessment, patient respiratory effort, 
and discomfort and the kind or the pattern of the pathology itself. The second principle is avoid sedation and paralysis. So never take away what can be given back. It's critically important to keep uh, the spontaneous breathing of the patient, not abolish it, especially if you suspect difficult intubation of back mask ventilation or surgical rescue for this patient. The third principle is, uh, is keep in mind that surgical management may be plan A. It doesn't necessarily to, to be plan B after you failed, uh, you failed uh, in the intubation and then do the rescue uh, uh, surgical uh, management. It can be plan A from the start. And uh, it should be done in a highly equipped area like OR, skilled and assist with you and contact the head and neck surgeons to be beside you. Uh, principle number four is buy time while examining the airway. And it's very important because uh, you will take time, of course, to prepare the difficult airway trolley. You will call for help. You will need the uh, assistant with you. You will call the theater to prepare for the coming patient. So don't do all of that on the, on the, and you are examining the patient as well. So don't do all of that and you are leaving the patient as it is. You can do a lot of actions or procedures that can optimize the condition of the patient, give yourself and the patient time until uh, you have a decision or management plan and prepare the environment for, uh, for this. So what you can do, you can connect the patient to high flow nasal uh, oxygen, setting up the patient, uh, as we said in the scopic, uh, scopic examination for the vocal cord, transfer to high critical uh, high uh, area like theater, put the monitor, consider uh, helix, helix in, in upper area obstruction, and it's very important to detect the cricothyro uh, mental, uh, the cricothyroid membrane, and to mark it. Even even theater, we, we encountered before many times that we failed uh, to do awake tracheal intubation, and we know this is very difficult to do with our conventional intubation. And the head and neck surgeons themselves they are marking the cricothyro uh, cricothyroid membrane, uh, epinephrine nebulization, steroids, and reassuring the patient and decrease the anxiety. The fifth principle uh, is intubation technique itself. Okay, so it, it, the decision how to secure the airway it depends on uh, uh, it, it, it will go in three options. So the first option you are using uh, direct or video laryngoscopy with in, inhalation induction. So still you are keeping the spontaneous breathing. The second one is awake tracheal intubation, either fiber optic or video laryngoscopy, and again spontaneous breathing is maintained. The third option is awake tracheostomy under local anesthesia, and again, the spontaneous ventilation is maintained. You don't want to be in a situation that you will start IV induction, muscle relaxant, and you are trying to intubate the patient, you fail to intubate the patient, and of course, the hypoxia and desaturation will be a bad consequence. This is a, a protocol. Uh, I don't know if it's clear or not for all of you, but if we can um, classify the two upper airway obstruction into two uh, categories. The first category is patient that is already in uh, like respect to arrest or about arrest, and you don't have any choice or you have, don't have any time uh, unless you're doing consider rapid sequence induction, attempt the endoscopy. If you are able to intubate, well and good. If not, uh, and in situation of can't intubate, can't oxygenate, you will proceed quickly for surgical airway. Okay, but if you have time and the patient is awake and breathing, okay, so your decision depends on your airway examination. So mild to moderate obstruction, airway obstruction, and you will be able to visualize the vocal cord by nasal endoscopy with minimal difficult airway character. We recommend to go for inhalation induction and using magra or video assisted, uh, video assisted laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy. But if mild to mild moderate obstruction, uh, you can still visualize the vocal cord, but there is a multiple difficult airway characters, as we said, like uh, uh, like uh, retrogantia, uh, large tongue, difficult, the criteria that we said, difficult intubation, difficult mask by mask. So uh, the recommendation here to you, uh, do awake fiber optic intubation under topical anesthesia. Uh, the third category is severe obstruction. You cannot visualize the vocal cord, severe respiratory stress, and here you can you, uh, go for awake tracheostomy under local anesthesia, like our patient. You will be able to visualize the, uh, the vocal cord. So that's what we said based on the previous knowledge. The decision was to do for our patients awake tracheostomy under local anesthesia. 
and the patient transferred to the ICU for post-operative care after this one. So our usual post-operative management uh, in the intensive care admission, routine post of intubation management, like uh, analgesia, sedation, uh, just uh, X-ray to detect the site of the tracheostomy or the site of uh, where the place uh, the tube. Uh, ventilator management, blood gas measurement, and uh, controlling the condition of the patient. And of course, if this is for further uh, intervention, like depulping of the tumor or removing uh, remove the cause of the uh, strider itself. So the uh, next two parts is we'll talk about the guidelines for the awake tracheal intubation 2019. Um, awake tracheal intubation is considered the gold standard in management of expected difficult airway. The incidence of awake tracheal intubation uh, from all intubation UK is 0.2%, which is low. And because the, the, this, this incidence is low, uh, there's a lot of factors. Um, one of them is the experience of the trainee and the, and the doctor of the awake tracheal intubation. Uh, and the second part is the, uh, the practice itself. Um, the, the key components of the awake tracheal intubation is stop, okay, sedation, topicalization, oxygenation, and performance. And we we uh, we appreciate this uh, the the S is small because the sedation is not in the mandatory to do or to perform awake tracheal intubation, especially if the case is an emergency, a morbid obese patient, um, uh, preferable to do uh, sedation. So, as we say, sedation, uh, with intubation may be performed without any sedation. You have to weigh between risks and benefits of the sedation. Uh, the usual uh, agents we are using remifentanil infusion or uh, dex uh, metomidine infusion. Uh, single agent strategy is safest for non expert anesthetists. Uh, for airway localization, and this is the uh, main part, and this is, uh, of, and really, this is the most important part. Uh, lead to successful awake tracheal intubation. Uh, you can, uh, with maximum dose nine milligram per lean body weight. Uh, nebulization, nebulized lignocaine can be used, but absorption is variable. Uh, there's a different practice uh, 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 about nebulized lignocaine. Uh, from my experience, and uh, for, it's not necessary to do uh, nebulized lignocaine. Uh, the most important is to the spray itself in the uh, either nasal or oral, and to have co complete block for the oropharynx and the glottic area and subglottic area. Glycoperolate uh, around 200 or 300 mic can be given. Uh, 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 better to be given around 20 to 30 minutes before performing the awake tracheal intubation. It minimizes or decreases the oral secretions, which help to absorb. The, uh, the local anesthetic, uh, local anesthesia uh, uh, faster. Uh, in terms of oxygenation, uh, so uh, there's a recommendation to uh, administer oxygen during awake tracheal intubation. Uh, it should be started as early as possible, the patient arriving to the theater. Uh, we recommend also the uh, recommendations to use high flow nasal oxygen uh, from 30 to 70 liter. Um, the reported instance of the saturation with this one is 0 to 1.5, is very low. Uh, in terms of performance, so selection of the, uh, the intracheal tube is very important. Um, a lot of analysis can, uh, can they are not notice that how much is important this one, but the recommendation is to use a reinforced tube and stay away from the, our conventional PVC tube. Uh, the pivot should be directed uh, posteriorly to, toward the posterior commission of the vocal cord and choose the, uh, the smallest tube as much as you can for your uh, patient. Uh, patient setting up, uh, if, uh, most probably if you are use, using, uh, doing, performing the tracheal intubation uh, uh, from the front uh, position, uh, ensure the operator can uh, see uh, the monitor, screen and pump and there is ergonomics is very important during performing awake tracheal intubation. Again, the awake tracheal intubation can be done by fiber optic or by video laryngoscopy. After intubation, you have to check two uh, points. Uh, you have to be sure that the intracheal, uh, the intracheal tube is uh, intracheal by visualizing the tracheal uh, lumen if you are do using fiber optic or to visualize the tube going between the vocal cords if you are using video laryngoscopy. 
And of course, you have to see capnographic wave on the monitor. And uh, I recommend all the all of you to to have a quick look on on, on the guidelines uh, in details about this one. This is a picture uh, talking about the ergonomics of the electric intubation. The operator is here, and this is the monitor for the patient. You can see here the video for the awake fiber optic and the pump, so he can see the three. If he's performing the electric intubation from back, again the pump is here and the uh, monitor and uh, the, uh, the video of, uh, and the monitor in front of the operator. This is what we talk about oxygenation performance, tubicalization, and sedation. So uh, complication and failed awake tracheal intubation. So the overall complication is around 18% and mostly due to inadequate stop. Uh, uh, you again, uh, during the, the death guideline, uh, you have to stop uh, uh, trying after uh, three uh, attempts and one uh, with the most experienced and senior uh, attempt. Unsuccessful attempt is defined by unplanned removal of the fiber optic or video endoscopy or the intracranial tube from the patient. Uh, and there is algorithm uh, you can follow in case of failed awake tracheal intubation. Again, this is the complication, how you can manage the complication uh, uh, in the stop. So if there is a problem with the oxygenation, you can uh, increase the FI2, change the mode of the oxygen delivery. Uh, I don't want to go into detail for this one, but just to have a look on, on this one. And this is the uh, protocol in case of uh, unsuccessful uh, well tracheal intubation. Uh, the third point is the can uh, intubate, can't oxygenate, and uh, fauna. So the uh, can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario uh, uh, incidence is 3.75 per 10,000 anesthes, uh, anesthesia, and then four identify the incidence of emergency fauna as one in 12, uh, uh, 12,500 to 50,000 uh, general anesthesia cases in UK. Uh, it is a part of the death guideline for difficult uh, intubation, uh, plan D, the uh, clinical thyroidotomy. So the most important part in the clinical thyroidotomy or the phone is to detect the uh, clinical thyroid membrane. So in all days or before, you can, you can uh, detect it by visualizing the anterior uh, neck skin crease and it's effective in 50% of patients, uh, which is very low, uh, or the conversion palpation and the successful rate is around 70% in non-OPs, 40% in OPs patients. And they recommended from the desk to use the laryngeal handshake uh, to detect the uh, clinical thyroid membrane. The fourth uh, technique is using the ultrasound. We'll discuss now the laryngeal handshake technique. It's a simple uh, maneuver that you, you put your thumb and your uh, index finger on the uh, greater cornea of the hyoid then sliding down to feel the, the two sides of the thyroid cartilage, coming more down to feel the uh, cricoid uh, uh, cartilage, and then by your index, palpate in the middle of the neck to see the cricothyroid membrane. So here, this one coming down and the, by the index to check the cricothyroid membrane. More prominent in, in, in male, uh, more difficult a little bit in females. Uh, the fourth part is the, uh, the ultrasound technique. We have two uh, ways, either longitudinal or transverse technique. Uh, for the longitudinal, you will put the linear probe in the midline of the neck. And you can see in the midline exactly here, this is the hyoid bone, which is a hypoechoic part. This is the cricoid. And you can see like uh, uh, chains of uh, uh, peds here. This is the tracheal rings. And the hyperechoic area, this is the air line and the mucous membrane. This is the isthmus, part of the isthmus. Okay, so when you see this one, the next step is you can put a cannula, okay, which is again like a metal part uh, between the cricoid and the uh, thyroid, the cricothyroid membrane, and then you can remove your uh, probe and mark this one. At, uh, you can use it uh, directly or in case uh, plant A is failed, so you go for the surgical rescue for the patient. For the transverse technique, uh, again, you can use, you use linear probe. Uh, it's more difficult in prominent thyroid colors like in males, Adam's apple, uh, and more convenient in females. So this is the hyoid bone, 
And you can see here, this is the hypo uh, uh, echoic part of the two vocal cords. And this is the retinoid cartilage here. So when you have this view, just you will slide down. So this is the view, I can move, I'll make it more. So this is the horseshoe shape of the uh, thyroid cartilage. And uh, if you displace your probe a little bit down, you'll find hyper echoic line. Okay, this is the cricothyroid membrane. Displace it more down, you'll find here, again, hyper hypoechoic. This is the cricoid cartilage above the hyper echoic line. It's like ring uh, uh, shape. So go up again to be sure that this is the air line uh, of the, uh, which equalizes the cricothyroid membrane. And here, this is your point of insertion. Uh, this is the kit for uh, can be uh, should be used for in case of uh, surgical rescue. It's very simple. Should be attached to each ventilator in the theater and in the emergency department. Uh, tube uh, intricate tube size uh, six can be reinforced or normal tube. Uh, uh, blade or uh, scalpel size eight or ten. Bougie and uh, 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 chlorhexidine for disinfection. So maximum extended for the neck, this is how to do the crico uh, thyroidotomy, neck extension of the neck. Again, uh, the laryngeal shake, palpate uh, uh, the larynx, they take the crico thyroid membrane by this one or by ultrasound, whatever. Then if you can feel it, the crico thyroid membrane, so step, rotate, insert the bougie, and then the intracranial tube. Okay, so step and then rotate, make the 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 the, the, the blade toward uh, the foot of the patient caudally, and then insert the bougie, and then after that insert the intracranial tube over the bougie. If you cannot palpate the the, if you cannot find the cricothyroid membrane, so you can make transverse uh, skin incision and try to palpate a small transverse skin incision by the blade and try to palpate the cricothyroid membrane. Again, rotate, bougie, and roll the intracranial tube. So uh, what I want to, at the end, to summarize uh, what we said, uh, the most important is to have plans in your mind. Every management is not a single plan. Uh, you have to plan A, plan B, and, and uh, of course, as a best guideline, there's A, B, uh, C, and D plans for this one. So uh, call for help, take your time, and if the patient is still uh, stable, uh, optimize the condition of the patient by your time by yourself and trying to do uh, any uh, surgical or intubation in a highly equipped theater, uh, like the area like theater, uh, with uh, your uh, with assistant and uh, specialized nurse for this one. Thank you so much. For Thank you very much, Dr. Islam, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, we have only one question from one question from Khalida Radwan. She says, "What to do if such a patient has COVID-19 and he is positive?" Uh, of course, uh, the, the, we stick to the, uh, guide, the local guidelines for your hospital. But uh, during uh, the era of the COVID-19, uh, of course, it was not recommended to use uh, awake fiber optic intubation for uh, patient uh, during the elective surgery. But uh, as, we are, as we are talking about emergency, I'm talking about, about our system here in Ireland. In the a &E themselves, they are separating the patient to COVID area and non-COVID area. And if you will transfer the patient to a theater, there is a dedicated theater for COVID patient. And of course, uh, all the personnel, including the nurses, the head and neck surgeons, will be with full gear uh, during from transferring, transferring the patient from the a &E to the theater. And uh, according to, as I said, the local guidelines for us here, uh, mm -hmm. after, after doing intubation, we have to wait for 10 minutes and then the surgeons can come to do the tracheostomy or the surgery. And uh, if they're planning to extubate the patient, we have to wait, of course, after this one also. So, yeah. Great. We have a few more questions, Dr. Islam. So uh, we have a question from Dr. Muhammad Ahmad Ali Ahmad. He says, can we use 14-gauge cannula as percutaneous cricothyroidotomy? Uh, okay. if, if you don't have any, uh, of course, if you have the critical therotomy uh, set, you can use the uh, uh, 14 gauge cannula for this one. But 
take care just to be cautious about to transfix the trachea going to the esophagus so just once you feel loss of resistance that's what we usually feel in the, uh, by, from the sc uh, scalp or the blade once you feel loss of resistance slide the cannula remove the uh, the trucker and uh, you can start to either insert like guide wire and put the intracheal tube after this one yeah another question by the same dr muhammad ahmed he is uh, he's asking how can you ventilate the patient through the cannula uh, doing this one either by uh, usually using like a high uh, frequency jet ventilation like uh, manu jet or uh, sanus if it's available uh, in the hospital if yes. not uh, depending on the amniac oxygenation you just connect on high pressure of oxygen uh, yes. but be cautious this is uh, uh, this situation even if you're using the jet ventilation this is a higher risk for power trauma uh, for those yes. kind of patients but if you don't have any other option you have to use this one with cautious and to add the least pressure that you can use it. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Asma Badawi. She, first of all, she thanks you for your lecture, as all we do. And then she said, do you recommend for uh, to give uh, muscle relaxation in difficult intubation or uh, and easy ventilation? Do you recommend that? Again, in difficult Do you recommend to give muscle relaxation in e difficult intubation but easy ventilation or no? Honestly, speak, during during our if the big if the case is an elective case uh, and there is an error instruction, I I, I I would say no, don't use uh, yep. muscle relaxation. Don't don't abolish the spontaneous breathing for this one because you can guarantee that you can ventilate the patient after yes. losing your own spontaneous breathing because after after you put them sleep, the hypo the hypotonia of the muscles can collapse this uh, area, the 40 or 30 percent remaining for this one, and sometimes you will not be able to ventilate the patient. Okay, there is a question by Dr. Muhammad Ali Siddiqui. He says, do you have any scope to use video still late for facilitating awake intubation? Yeah, this is uh, and, uh, the awake tracheal intubation, as we said, either fiber optic, which is the most, uh, most common before, but now the era is going for awake uh, video laryngoscopy, yep. which is, was proved by many studies that is easier even for the trainee to be uh, more confident to use it than the fiber optic and faster in preparation and easier for that we need to get learned with this one. And there is Actually, you, you just answered the next question by Dr. Khaled uh, Muhammad Abdel Latif. He says, which technique you recommend for awake intubation, fiber optic or inhalation induction? You just answered this question. Or inhalation and induction. Uh, yes. No, uh, it depends on the, on, on, on the patient, and but you have to be ready for all. But if you are confident and depends on that, and this is experience. If you are confident about the awake tracheal intubation, I recommend it strongly yes. than the inhalation, of course, for this one. And um, okay. we, we, we make a systematic review comparing between awake uh, fiber optic intubation by uh, bronchoscopy or video angioscopy. And, and as I said, uh, the result is more towards the video angioscopy in terms of the success of the first uh, tracheal attempt and the uh, patient satisfactory for this one. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Islam. That's Pura Ines, all. Pura Ines, please. Yes. If you don't mind, I uh, want to comment and ask uh, Dr. Islam one question. Of course, Professor Islam. Thank you. Dr. Islam, you touched a very uh, important subject today because this subject is uh, we are facing uh, even uh, every day, every moment in the OR or in the recovery. Specifically with, uh, as you mentioned, the strider with the pediatric even. Uh, and we need uh, meticulous and brave anesthetist, not to be in uh, hurry or to be in panic. And I think the uh, first uh, step uh, for management of uh, obstructive airway management is to call for help. Definitely, for, yeah. expert, for expert persons, Specifically, we have in every hospital uh, expert persons in the airway uh, management. And we are doing a lot of workshops in the airway management. So it is not yeah, just to give uh, my colleagues and my uh, residents, my uh, juniors, uh, a home message. It is not shameful, even for us, <coughs> the seniors, to call for help for any problem facing NZ anesthesia specifically for the airway because this is life saving. Exactly. This is number one. The second one, if you please, the teaching process in our hospitals nowadays depends on the technology. And I am not against technology. 
Uh, nowadays, as you, uh, as we uh, listen from uh, Dr. Yasser and our colleagues that, and uh, before Dr. Hazim, uh, we are using uh, uh, ultrasound in everything nowadays. Exactly, yeah. but, uh, I am stressing about the management and the uh, intubation, endotracheal intubation. I see nowadays uh, uh, for our residents, they make it easy to use glidoscope, uh, fiber optic, and they are neglecting using the usual and the traditional laryngoscopy. So I am stressing for our residents and juniors to uh, uh, to know the principle of the intubation first. I'm not against technology. Like the laparoscopic or the robotic surgery, sometimes the surgeon, he knows the laparoscopic and the robotic surgery. And if something happened, he cannot manage by the traditional surgery. The, uh, maybe I am an old man and I am uh, with the uh, tradition or, uh, uh, but I am using. I am using the lightoscope, but not to be, not to be as you, every case, every case, every case, we have glidoscope. We may go for any place in our country or other countries or in the periphery, and we may not find the glidoscope or, or this technology. Are you agree with me? Exactly, Dr. Hassan. That's uh, it's happened to me here in Ireland. I, I, what you are saying is really because when I'm doing my airway fellowship in the moment hospital, the protocol there is using Magra for all patients. All patients using Magra, and of course, this is better than glidoscope and more safe. We agree about this one. But one, once I transferred to Vincent Hospital, my liver uh, fellowship now, uh, I, I encountered a difficult intubation. And uh, the, the nurse, she told me that there is three magra only on the whole theater, and it was not available beside me. I tried two times or, and three times by the diagnosis, I was not able to visualize the vocal cord. So at that stage, I told her, but I feel when I'm doing this one, after one year using magra, I feel still, you know, not the confidence, but you lost a little bit the skill how to do it, you know? Just for one year, I'm using the McGraw. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not, of course, you, you, all of you are my professors, but 16 years in anesthesia, of course, you know. But I, it's very important to every now and then to keep your, your skills, basic skills, like the uh, like the central line, ultrasound is the central line. Every yeah. now and then, every 10 patients, I'm doing one anatomical like before in all old days where I don't have central line, uh, ultrasound for this one. Just in case of emergencies, just in case you don't have it. Absolutely, I agree. And of yes. course, the call of help, this is number one in the DAS guideline to call of help. And this is very important, very, very important. Even even the, the help will be the same level of you or, or, or even lower, but at least we'll give you second hand for you. There are two more questions for Dr. Islam, if you don't mind. One of them is about emergency situations like road traffic accident. If you have a patient that has a fully stomach and is a difficult intubation uh, uh, scenario, what are the options available? Spray trauma or facial trauma is, 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 is a wide or broad topic, you know, according to where the fracture, if, if there's a fracture, yep. if it's not maintain it away. But of course, if, 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 if the patient is fully stomach uh, and you are going difficult and suspect difficult intubation, you can do it by away fiber optic. It's not a contraindication if the patient is fully stomach. Uh, but the problem yep. is uh, that's why if there's bleeding inside, it will be difficult by fiber optic because of the bleeding, it will. Of course, uh, the yes. you will not be able to visualize. Exactly. Yes. So you can do it by visual endoscopy, it would be more convenient if we would be able to yes. do that. The last okay. question for the night is the role of uh, intubating laryngeal mask in difficult airway and if there is a role of video assisting in difficult airway. I think you already answered the video assisting. So video yes, we already answered the video, uh, video assisting, so we will okay. just uh, give a hint about laryngeal can mask. I, can I make uh, one announcement, if you don't sure. mind, please? Uh, next Sunday, okay. we have uh, Prof. Hazim Yassin. He's going to talk to us about um, uh, trauma rapid response team and ACLS. So it will be complementary to this lecture and complementary to the last lecture he gave already before and he's with us today. And uh, uh, Sunday 13th of uh, September, we have Professor Muhammad al Tahan. He is going to talk about his experience about video laryngoscopy in pediatric patient in pediatric obstructive airway. So um, this course, mega online course, will have a massive experience about uh, regional anesthesia, pain, 
uh, airway uh, trauma, and of course, uh, the endless uh, intensive care experience by our eminent distinguished speaker, Professor Samir Ansari, is the top star of this uh, course. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, today. And I am overwhelmed by this attendance and uh, the success of the night. And uh, wish you all. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you.